Hello, um, I'm Alexandra Skaggs with Barron's, uh, and I'm here with Gary Gensler, former chair of the CFTC, formerly with the Treasury Department, and doing all sorts of stuff at MIT. Um, I think it's uh, what, teaching and working with the FinTech Lab and working with the Media Lab. Um, can you, can, actually, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, well, I, um, after a career in finance by the Goldman Sachs and then in public service, I found myself at uh, MIT teaching really talented students uh, at the Sloan uh, School of Management, where I've taught about a couple hundred students on blockchain and money and cryptocurrencies and so forth. But I'm also a co-director of the FinTech Lab at our computer science and AI part of the campus. And then at the Media Lab, I'm involved in the digital currency initiative and some AI initiatives. Um, yeah, it's super interesting stuff that you're working on. And, you know, we were talking actually before in the green room about just even the meaning of the word fintech. Um, I mean, it's sort of fuzzy, right? Like, what is, like, money could be fintech, right? So I think of fintech, and I know you're all at a conference and have paid good money to be here, but I think that finance and technology have had a symbiotic relationship for thousands of years. And early fintech was actually money and ledgers. And when, 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 we came along with the telegram, you know, then we had new fintech, which was digital money, actually has been around since the 1830s or 1840s in some form. Um, but I think of fintech as innovative technologies that could have a material change on financial services. So I would not no longer call the cloud fintech. The cloud's been around for a while, even though big Big finance has not adopted a lot of the cloud. I wouldn't call the telephone fintech anymore, even though it was in the 1920s. But I would say that AI, machine learning, the pattern recognition around machine learning is transformative and can be. Probably less so than the hype. I'd say blockchain technology could be a catalyst for change. Probably less than the hype. Uh, I think open APIs are still sort of the... So, but I, I approach it from now an MIT perspective, more what's on the cutting edge uh, and so forth. And to talk, I guess, a little bit more about the present, you know, you were talking about blockchain um, and sort of its role in fintech today. And like you said, there is a lot of hype about blockchain, um, a lot of conflation with cryptocurrency, which I know they're different things. Um, and can you talk a little bit more about how blockchain fits into the universe right now and sort of, um, you know, how it measures up to the hype, in your sure. view. So there was, a, there was a riddle about money that came along in the 1990s. We were sending packets of information around the internet, data around the internet, and didn't have a way to send money around the internet. We solved that by having security layers. The year after Amazon and eBay were uh, formed, we figured out how to have secure transmissions on the internet, but we still had a riddle about money. Satoshi Nakamoto comes along in 2008 in the heart of the crisis. By the way, does anybody know who Satoshi Nakamoto is? Can I see a show of hands? Does anybody know him personally? Oh, I always ask. I want to know. So we don't know who Satoshi Nakamoto is. But she comes along, let's say, and says, here's a new technology for peer-to-peer -peer transfer of money digital money with no central authority. The technology actually works. Mm -hmm. It actually works. It's slow. It does, it's not performance ready, really. But you can move packets of data, which represent value, money, without a central authority. And so thus, it's a private form competing with the official sector in terms of money. Uh, I think it will be a catalyst for change. I think central bankers around the globe, when I talk to them, are talking about how to change the payment system. Some central banks, like the Central Bank of Sweden, is actually saying, should we have e-krona, a tokenized money? You'll hear from Jeremy, Alir, and Sean Neville in a few minutes from Circle, and they, they have a tokenized US dollar that they, they have stood up with Coinbase. So it's changing some of the provisions of finance, but it's far less than the hype. Right, and I, that all raises a really interesting question because, you know, having the private money provision and transfer, um, there's already a robust public sector that does that. Um, and how do you think that those two are going to interact in the future? Do you think it's just going to be adopted wholeheartedly? Do you think that um, there's going to be more government crackdown on this sort of stuff? Like, 
So there's a lot of questions embedded in that. I think the US dollar is going to be around for a long time. Um, I think that fiat currency, that which is a government-backed currency, uh, if you have a, a decent monetary policy, you don't even have to have the best monetary policy, but if you have a decent monetary policy and decent fiscal policy, most fiat currencies will survive because they have tremendous network effects. They're, they have a better network than even Facebook or Google because we all accept it. And we accept it for all debts, public and private, and so forth. And taxes are paid in it. But in some countries, maybe a Venezuela, where they don't have a decent monetary policy or financial policy, you could see cryptocurrencies uh, creeping in. Um, they are a, a form of digital gold, as Nathaniel Popper wrote. Um, and they're worth about a quarter of a billion dollars. But gold is worth eight trillion. So yes, it's a speculative class, but I think, I think it might persist. The underlying technology goes to the plumbing of finance. Yeah. The underlying technology has some interesting uh, um, uh, attributes. Uh, if you want multi -party sh multiple parties sharing a digital ledger. And that sort of raises the question about public sector adoption, like you were saying, you know, talking about e-cronas. Um, I mean, how, how widespread are the discussions about that? And what's the sort of outlook? Like, do you think that we've really got a shot for? So uh, it's interesting. I, I have the opportunity, because I uh, used to meet with a lot of central bankers around the globe, to still be invited to some of their forums, uh, whether it's in uh, Basel, Switzerland, or in Tokyo, Japan, or elsewhere. And um, the G20 is meeting this month in Japan. And one of the things they're taking up is blockchain technology and uh, the effect on finance of decentralization. Mm -hmm. And the Financial um, Stability Board, which is an international group, published two papers in the last week on each of those topics. So to answer your question, yes, they're thinking of it seriously. And Christine Lagarde, who runs the IMF, is saying, well, maybe we should actually be more open-minded about cryptocurrencies and, and tokenized fiat. And yet the head of the Bank of International Settlement, the former head of the Mexican Central Bank, uh, Augustin Corns, says, no, not so fast. So there's kind of an interesting, healthy debate uh, going on. And there's a little bit of a push and pull, right? Like you're saying, um, and there's a trade-off, too, because on one hand, you know, it seems like the technology is really useful, but on the other, you give some things up, like privacy, and you know, like a cashless society isn't cost-free, right? Uh, no, but, but by a show of hands, how many people have used US dollar, paper, linen dollars in the last day? Actually used it. I did on the cab here, but all right, so about a third of the group. That means two-thirds of you haven't. And I, I, I believe that your children, depending upon your age here, but your children won't even really recognize it when they're your age. They won't be using physical currency. So that's the, the world of the future uh, for all of us. And is that just like a privacy-free world when it comes to money, or do you think that no, 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 no. We've all given up our privacy. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, uh, the presentation right before us, Aria, right, yeah. talked about big tech. Big tech is moving as they can and as they're thoughtfully trying to get into the payments mm -hmm. and into the consumer finance side here in the US, but they've already very dominantly done it in China. So, you know, our business model here in the US, banks had more uh, uh, footprint, they had more customers. But in China, it was leapfrogged by Alipay and by uh, uh, Tension or we, WeChat and so forth. Um, in Kenya, mm -hmm. uh, leapfrogged by the telephone companies, Safaricom. Um, so I think that big tech will move in. But no, we've given up our privacy because big tech knows how to take our data. Yeah, I was going to say, um, you know, that's having them take such a central role in the payment system and sort of these things, um, you know, without necessarily the same accountability mechanisms that a government would have. I mean, 
is this something that people should be thinking about, be worrying about, or do you think you know it's just already happened? And well, um, in terms of privacy, if that's what you're asking, yeah. I think we're going to go through a quite interesting debate here in the U.S. And Europe is ahead of us. Europe uh, uh, adopted a set of rules, GDPR. Uh, and if you're thinking in the fintech space here in the U.S., uh, we'll have something not identical, but something like GDPR very much debated here in the U.S. It will probably start even now. You even see Senator Warner mm -hmm. speaking about it recently, a senator uh, from Virginia. Um, you have California adopting some rules in state. So you have one of 50 states now that has privacy rules for big data and it will affect big finance and fintech. But I think the rules from Europe, GDPR, you need to be very aware of it if you're building out your model internationally in terms of basically the right to be forgotten, the right to sort of be able to amend data and so forth like that. Right. And so that, that's sort of a little more forward looking. And I know that you know, talking about the future of fintech, which you know, this is the conference, um, I know that you're working with uh, some companies on some pretty cutting edge stuff at MIT. Uh, so I don't know if you could tell us a little bit about those. So we have a, a initiative, and we stand these up at MIT from time to time. We have an initiative where 12 financial firms have funded a group called FinTech at the Computer Science and AI Lab. And, and it's a way to a group of companies to jointly fund sponsored research. And it's kind of interesting. We were able in our first year to work with these uh, uh, dozen companies from around the globe. I mean, they range uh, from uh, uh, city back, city bank to, to consensus, you know, to sort of just give a, a range of, of the, the space that they might be in. Uh, and uh, I'd say three or four of our 10 projects are really about deep learning, machine learning, and the cutting edge of AI artificial intelligence. Two or three are in the smart contract blockchain space. There's one or two on network communication and network security. You might think cybersecurity, but it's also the communication protocols mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, it's an interesting project on how to take uh, uh, speech recognition and get it into the call centers and robotics and things like that. Um, but generally, the chief technology officers are bringing issues to MIT that they're sort of saying, we can't quite solve these. Where, do you, where can you take this? Uh, for instance, one project is how to take natural language and, and change it into computer code so that you can take natural language and create smart contracts and automate contractual arrangements. So. Oh, that sounds like really interesting stuff in general, though I always have to wonder, like, when it gets down to brass tacks, like, what does this stuff do for companies? Like, how does it affect the bottom Great line? Great question. Look, there's a lot of hype. I would step back and I'd say I think that the, the trends, the modern fintech, as opposed to yesterday's cloud uh, computing and so forth, cloud is still here today, but I don't think it's going to, I think it's the largest things are around machine learning and artificial intelligence, and though there's a lot of hype, I think that the ability to do better pattern recognition, the ability to basically, when I was uh, sort of a young math geek and learned linear algebra and learned statistics, I could not have imagined what you could do now with machine learning. The ability to do pattern recognition, I think, will change credit underwriting, will change all sorts of risk assessment for insurance companies, and will change some of the investing in capital markets. And I've even said to colleagues of mine in our world-class finance group at Sloan that it will change how academic finance is even done, because it's fundamentally about pattern recognition. I think it raises a whole bunch of public policy issues. And right now, there are no public policy worldwide standards or local standards. But the big firms, and they sometimes come to even MIT and ask these questions, they say, we're having challenges with the interpretability of what we do. You know, we have problems with biases. And whether it's in the criminal justice system or in the allocation of credit, when you can't explain the algorithms, you've got a little bit of a challenge with your customer base. Mm -hmm. You sometimes have a challenge with your board of directors and your credit committee and your risk committee, and you can also have problems with your regulators. Mm -hmm. So the interpretability, the biases, the 
uh, and so forth. Um, I think that's a big, interesting space. We've already talked about blockchain. I'd say the one other place I think practically, and we're seeing the official sector get involved, is opening up bank accounts and bank ledgers through what's called open APIs, basically allowing you all in the fintech space, allowing big tech to get access into the, the customer accounts. And whether it's the payment system directive in Europe or open API or just scraping, plain old scraping the data, I think that's changing some of the uh, landscape. And how far along is the US in that specifically? Because I know Europe has done open banking for a little while, um, but you know the United States payment system is not traditionally known for its groundbreaking technology. <laughs> no, I think, I think uh, look, we have in some ways a very efficient payment system, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of economic rents. I mean, we spend, as a nation, between 100 billion and 200 billion dollars a year in our payment space half a percent to one percent of our gross domestic product. Um, and it's not without its costs. Um, uh, and Visa and MasterCard is going to do everything they can. And even Stripe, that was on the stage earlier, you know, part of it. Uh, when I was chief financial officer for the Hillary campaign, we did use Stripe. So there's a shout out for him. <laughs> we lost, so I don't know. You know, at Stripe, sorry. Um, but uh, uh, but uh, that's not the reason. But uh, uh, where were we? No, all right. Okay. Um, um, I think that the payment space uh, in the U.S. has been slow to adapt. I think China, Kenya, India, many, many countries are ahead of us, have leapfrogged us, partly because they didn't have the legacy systems in place. I think you're right about open, open access to bank accounts is being pushed by the official sector in Europe, but I think the technologists in this room and the venture capitalists in this room are pushing it, and even if you have to scrape the pages, yeah. you'll get some of that data. And so what, uh, can you talk a little bit more about the sort of purpose of that? Like so in essence, the purpose is, is that um, Around the globe, central banks have, in essence, given a franchise to commercial banks. Now, the commercial banks will disagree a little bit like this, but I think about it like McDonald's. McDonald's franchises. The central bank is the central organization, and we have 9,000 banks, and they can have bank accounts and that customer relationship, and they're the only ones that can control that sub-ledger called money. We've got some competition coming from Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, but another attack vector, in a sense, to that franchise system is you all, but also merchants who says, I, I want to have access directly to the bank account. I don't want to have to have all the regulations. I don't want to have to store the value. But if Gary Gensler says, listen, I'm, I want to give my merchant permission to access my bank account, that they can access it and move my money. And I already do that. I do it with the, my utility bill every month. Right. You know, Verizon goes in, takes it, moves a ledger balance called money into Verizon. But in Europe, they're basically saying, no, you have to open up more. You have to open up to the fintech firms and to the, the startups, and you have to open up to the merchants more. Um, and from the, because you were saying like they, some people are scraping web pages and sort of being innovative in the way that they're going about it. Um, is that also for like consumer payments or is that a different purpose? It's basically for access to the account information because oh, the see. data yeah. is so important. Mm -hmm. right. um, but it's better to have an open API, mm -hmm. basically an open access that you can move a ledger balance. Mm -hmm. I know I'm talking technical, but moving the money. But money is just a ledger balance. It's a digital representation of a social construct that we all accept. Um, yeah. We do, a, we do. But listen, if here. our central bank, if Jay Powell <laughs> lost control, Jay's not going to lose control. But if Jay Powell lost control of our money and our central government all of a sudden was printing too much, we wouldn't trust. Mm -hmm. And so in Venezuela, of course, they don't trust their right, currency. Right. But that also, I mean, so that sort of goes back to the cryptocurrency question. And um, the thing that keeps coming up for me is just that cryptocurrencies, I think, exist and people use them 
you know, almost despite the state, because it's sort of like, the, if, if I were a state, I would not want people using a competitor to my you wouldn't, currency. Huh? I don't you, think you're, so. You're a monopolist? Maybe. Okay. <laughs> I see. No, I, I think that cryptocurrencies, they, they, they came about, Satoshi Nakamoto wrote her seminal, seminal paper, eight pages, on Halloween night in the middle of the crisis in 2008. I don't think that's just by accident. It was like everything was falling asunder. And so um, it's competition. It's private sector competition with central bank money. But most central bankers I talk to uh, uh, aren't, aren't looking to shut it down. They're looking to adapt. Well, definitely interesting stuff. And I think that's all the time we have uh, for our talk. But thank you so much. It thank was really you so interesting. Much. It was great. Thanks. Thank you.